All right, so in this module, we're going to actually start to write our first C++ program. Um, and in, b before we get right to the, the language itself, um, I want to take the time now to, to build up from the level of binary numbers and binary instructions that we saw in the last module to, some, to, to, to give you a little bit of context on how we get to C++. Um, the focus of this module is not really on understanding a lot of the syntax. Um, I want to get you used to the process of creating some code, compiling it, which will turn it into an executable or binary instructions, and then running the program through um, the command prompt um, or the command line. Um, we're going to use Windows. Um, in these modules. I'm going to use Visual Studio. Um, specifically, the videos have Visual Studio 2012. Um, you can use Visual Studio 2013 or 14. That's fine. Um, remember that all the labs on, on um, campus would probably have, would, would definitely have um, Visual Studio available to you. You can also use any other um, machine platform that you wish. C++ um, works everywhere, but I'm going to go through in this module um, the specific instructions to make it work with Visual Studio. Okay, so before we get going, um, remember, you know, from the last uh, module, um, we could we could encode everything as ones and zeros, and the ones and zeros represented whether or not electricity was flowing through a transistor or a wire. Um, now you could program entirely in ones and zeros if you wanted to. Um, you could, we could write um, the code required to record this video in ones and zeros. Um, we would definitely go insane. We would definitely accomplish very little in a very vast amount of time, um, but we could do it. Um, and in fact, that's how people used to program machines. The very first computers were, were developed simply for computing trajectories of missiles and, and for, for military applications. And they weren't very general purpose. Um, they just did very, um, you know, rote calculations. Um, complicated calculations, but calculations that we could program once and then redo or actually execute hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, the ENIAC was maybe not necessarily the first computer, but the first well-known computer. It was the size of a building. Um, it had what amounts to 19,000 vacuum tubes, and vacuum vacuum tubes were the predecessor to transistors. So it essentially had the ability to store 19,000 ones and zeros. Today's computers can hold trillions of ones and zeros. Um, so we, we've and, and of course they fit in a, in our pockets. So. We, we've come a long way, and programming the ENIAC, the difference between the hardware and the speed is dramatic from what we see today. Um, what we don't often appreciate, but what we, we hopefully we will now, as, as you learn to program, is that the, the, the change in the way we write programs has, has, has grown up and changed almost in the same magnitude as the speed and the size have changed. Programming these machines literally meant rewiring the machine, um, rewiring the vacuum tubes together so they would perform some different computation. Um, that's something clearly we don't do anymore. So one of the first big steps up from binary um, was the development of assembly language. Um, assembly language um, doesn't really buy us a whole amount in terms of um, power and of expression. Uh, but it does free us from having to remember the fact that 001 corresponds to one operation, 110 corresponds to addition, or something like that. It frees us from having to write instructions in binary. Uh, so if we look down here, we've got a binary instruction. I've sort of artificially divided it into thirds, one being the opcode and then two operands, um, or potentially even four operands down here. And what assembly code looks like, and this is something that a human would write, um, is it's a symbolic notation that, that maps directly to binary. So instead of saying 110 for add, let's say, and telling the addition operation to add, which in register 2, or 3, sorry, and register 2, and put it in register 1, we literally just say dollar sign $3, dollar sign $2, dollar sign $1, the dollar sign being sort of a special um, character, special syntax to say that we're talking about a register. Um, so that instruction add 
add what's in register 3 and what's in register 2 and store it into register 1 is, is certainly more readable. It's more natural um, than a binary number down here. Um, and this, these LWs is for loading a word, so we would be able to load specific values into registers. Again, these would map to regular binary instructions. You see the same opcode 010 is being used for load word in both instructions. Uh, we've got the different register numbers. Uh, the key thing here is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, and we can actually build a program to take this text and convert it to binary, and that would be called an assembler. Um, and we can write the text um, in a variety of different ways, and we can store them. So we started out with punch cards where we'd punch out little slots for for the different instructions we wanted to. Eventually, that made way to tape drives and to hard drives and everything that we see now. Um, so assembly language is helpful, uh, but it still requires us to think in terms of individual additions, individual loading of values into registers. It, need, it, it requires us to work with um, at a very, very high level of detail or very low level of detail directly with the hardware. We need to know how many registers are on the machine. We need to know what operations are spec specified. In order to create programs that do what we say today, um, we, we simply can't write at this level of detail. Um, we need to allow the language that we use to communicate with the program um, to sort of hide some details from us, or to maybe better than saying hide, um, sort of repeat some of the details for us automatically. Um, and that's where we get what are called higher level programming languages. Um, so higher level languages um, are different from assembly language because assembly language is really just a one-to-one -one translation of the tedious binary ones and zero operations, the add, subtract, load, store. Um, we want to solve much more complicated problem, problems um, like upload this image and tag me so my friends can see me on their newsfeed. Um, that does indeed convert into add, subtract, load, and store, but it converts the same way as the last time that you uploaded a picture and tagged someone. Um, and so what we do is we build higher level languages that sort of encapsulate some of the really small instructions. Um, similar to, to a way of, of telling somebody, giving somebody directions to um, get to a building. You know, maybe, maybe somebody stops you on a street and they, they ask you for directions to get to some, some address. Um, technically speaking, you could start to tell them, you know, okay, well, put both hands on the steering wheel and press the pedal down and do that for five seconds and then turn the steering wheel left. You don't do that. You don't explain things in that level of detail. You just say, you know, go to your go to the next stop sign and make a left. Um, the idea of a higher level language is to speak to the computer like that. Speak to the computer a little bit higher level and let the computer carry out the rote, tedious details to some extent. Um, now, I don't want to um, give you the impression that the, the higher level languages that we learn allow us to talk to a computer in plain English. Um, when we talk to people in plain English, they make a lot of inferences about what we're saying. The computer is very, very specific, um, but it, these higher level languages are a vast improvement on something like binary. So a higher level language is, adds the concept of things like variable names, for instance. Um, a variable name is a symbolic notation, say, say um, you know, uh, dollars, how, many, how much money do you have? Um, that you're going to store that in a particular address in memory that could convert to you know, address 216 in main memory. Instead of referring to it as address 216 or register 3, we're going to refer to it as dollars um, or cars or whatever we're doing a computation on. Um, higher level languages will add concepts like conditionals. If this is true, do this particular instruction. Otherwise, do something else. Um, by the way, the way we'll say if this is true is by using Boolean logic. We can use loops, um, keep doing this instruction until this certain condition happens. Um, and there are a lot more elaborate structures. So that's what high level languages are going to give us and that's really what we're going to talk a lot about um, this semester. So if you think about how, how this all fits together, um, the CPU only sees binary code. Um, it sees ones and zeros. And a, a step above that is a program called the assembler, which takes assembly code and converts it to that binary. 
Um, we will use an assembler every time we program, but we won't really think about it explicitly. On top of assembly language, now we've built higher level programming languages. A compiler, which is another program, um, will create from high level language assembly code, and then the assembler will convert the binary. You are sitting between high level languages and natural languages. Um, when we communicate to each other, um, we com communicate at a very, very high level. Um, the programmer is going to need to put that into a form of high-level language, put that into very specific instructions, in our case into C++. Um, and you know, the, the, the boundaries here become blurred. Uh, as our languages get more complex, they start to look a little bit more like natural language. Um, but frankly, that, that, that part where a programmer needs to solve the problem probably is very unlikely to go away. So when we, create, when, when we start to work, you're going to look at a problem assignment. You're going to look at a, a job to do. You're going to write some C++ code, some high-level languages. Um, and then you're going to build your program. You're going to click a button. It's going to build. It's going to invoke a compiler. And if, it, if, it, if it's correct syntax and if it's correct language features, um, it'll go into assembly and then automatic to binary code. The output of your programs, um, this binary code, I'm going to call executables. And they're actually separate files that are created and generated for you. And those are the ones that you're going to run. Um, now, I've mentioned in, we're, we're going to cover C++. Um, and in fact, higher level languages, there are many, many higher level languages. Um, C, C++, Java, C Sharp, they're all pretty much, those, those four languages are very similar to each other. Um, JavaScript is syntactically very similar to C++, but that's on the web. Um, you've got lots of scripting languages, Ruby, Python, Perl, PHP for the web, COBOL, Fortran for older um, technology, banking software, engineering software, um, HTML, CSS, XML, XSL, all web-related languages, Visual Basic, R, use a lot in spreadsheets and scientific calculations, um, and, and I can't even come close to naming all of them. Um, in fact, there's another, there's another high-level language being created right now, likely. Um, we have many, many languages, just like we have many natural languages. Um, and some are very, very specialized. Some, you know, something like HTML only makes sense within the context of creating a web page. Uh, but others are very general purpose. Um, so languages like C++, like Java, are extremely general purpose. They can be used for virtually any purpose on a computer. Um, and the nice thing about programming is that, you know, although there, there might seem like there's this infinite number of programming languages to learn, there really isn't. Um, once you sort of learn to program in any one of the languages, um, you will be able to pick up the next language much, much more quickly. Um, it is not like learning English and then trying to learn Spanish. Um, it's more like learning English in the Northeast and then driving down to the south and making and, and having a little bit of difficulty with the dialect. dialect. Um, it's not a tremendous difference. There's just some, some, some small quirks to things. Okay, so what does C++ look like? Um, well, we, we looked at binary and when we saw assembly um, in C++, notice now we're not talking about registers anymore and we're certainly not using keywords like load word and add. Um, now we're actually creating variables. So I'm creating a variable x, y, and z, and behind the scenes there's going to be a whole lot that's going to happen to make this work. The computer's going to actually find a location in main memory where we can store an integer. Um, and then it's going to remember that the next time I use the word x or to use the name x, that, to go, that I'm going to go to that location in memory and work with that specific area. Uh, I can assign values to these variables. I can store 5 into x, which is analogous to perhaps mapping x to register 1 and loading 5 into register 1, which is again analogous to this binary instruction. Um, so in, in this particular example, I'm loading x and y, and then I'm adding them together and storing in a new variable. Um, this somewhat looks one-to-one, -one, um, and as we, as we grow our knowledge of C++, we'll see that this will be one too many. Um, we'll have very few lines of C++ code um, relative to how many lines of assembly we would eventually have to look at. Keep in mind that this is likely the last time we will look at assembly today, or um, throughout the rest of the semester, um, and certainly the last time we'll see binary as well. 
um, we will be working predominantly at this top level. So as I mentioned, to turn C++ into binary instructions, we need the use of a compiler. Um, a compiler's job is to look at the C++ syntax and evaluate it. Um, one of the things that we will find with programming is that um, it's very, very specific. Um, when you write an essay and you leave out a period somewhere, or you leave out a comma somewhere, or you misspell a name, um, the reader of your essay can generally make sense of it. It's not as if you know one missing comma makes your entire 10-page paper indecipherable. Um, that's not the case with programming, and that's a challenge when you start to learn it. Um, one misplaced keystroke, the program in, in its entirely is in its, it's in its entirety, excuse me, is invalid. Um, so attention to detail will be very important. The compiler is a very sophisticated piece of software, but you probably won't really think it is right away. Um, because the compiler is going to tell you every single last little error that you make and you're going to be a little bit frustrated probably in the beginning. The compiler that we use is called Microsoft Visual Studio. Um, it's a massive program. Um, Visual Studio is geared towards professional software developers. So one of the things we'll do in this module, um, and I think I'll divide it into two sections here for us, um, is go slowly through Visual Studio so we can make our way through that program. It's a, it's a large program. It's like learning Microsoft Word for the first time. Um, probably a little bit easier, less options, but, but it, just as big of a program. Um, we're going to create C++ sor source code um, that we will store in files with the .cpp extension. So a Word document is .docx, an Excel file is .xlsx. Um, a C++ file is .cpp. Visual Studio, with a click of a button, will build an executable, which has a f which is another file with a .exe extension, and it will have it'll contain binary instructions. Okay, so um, I'm gonna our, in our next topic here, we're gonna switch over and we're gonna start to look at um, the, the details of Visual Studio. Um, I encourage you at the same time to look through the walkthroughs that are on Moodle um, on, on, on the course website. Um, that will give you a little bit more detail. Um, as we go through this, um, you, you will find using the command prompt using Visual Studio a little bit difficult at first. Um, I promise that after a few tries of this, though, you will get the hang of it. Um, so don't get too discouraged by using Visual Studio initially. Um, in, in the next recording, we will learn all we need to know about working with Visual Studio throughout the rest of the semester. Um, so, so, so you'll have plenty of time to sort of get, get better at these skills.